Praise God. Hallelujah. Drop the little blue thing over there. Huh? Grandma's sick tonight. She's not feeling good. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for Grandma. God, we pray a mighty anointing of the Holy Ghost upon her right now. From the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. Father, we pray that you will, by the power of your spirit, just touch her and heal her. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, if you have your Bibles, your how many have your Bibles? Everybody get your Bible? Amen. Praise God. Don't come to Bible study without a Bible. Hallelujah. Coming to, coming to Bible study without a Bible is like going to work without clothes. <laughs> Hallelujah. You wouldn't go to work with no clothes on, would you? Well, don't come to Bible study without your Bible. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to start with verse 12 tonight. It says, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. I'm going to change my mic here. Test one, two. There we go. Wherefore, lift up our hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Here the scripture is talking about someone who's just gone through the chastising of the Lord. If you read the previous scripture, it says about chastising. For a few days they were chastised after their own pleasure, but, for, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Those that have feeble knees that have gone through difficulties, trials, tribulations, persecutions, we that are strong are to lift up the weak. Amen? We're to strengthen the hands of those that are weak and, we're, and hang down, and we're to also help those and lift those up that have feeble knees, that have not necessarily just in the physical realm, but in the spiritual realm. Sometimes people are weak. Sometimes people are having difficulties, and we should have a discerning spirit to know which uh, of these things are affecting some people that we may know. And give them a call. If you haven't seen them in church for a while, give them a call. It's not always up to the pastor to do that. You know, sometimes they like to hear from somebody else other than the pastor, that somebody cares on their level, so to speak. You know, they always think the pastor's way up here and we're not way up here. The only reason why we're way up here is because we're on a platform. But other than that, we're on the same level ground as you are. We still have temptations and fighting and, and persecution and all those good things that normally happen to Christians. So they happen to us for what reason? Why do we go through the things we go through? Huh? Yes, so we may be partakers of his holiness. That's how God gets all that stuff out of us. Amen? Gets us to totally depend upon God and less to depend upon ourselves. Next verse, please. And he says, and make straight paths for your feet. Now that doesn't mean to get a backhoe or a shovel and start preparing your pathway in a literal sense where you have to make your crooked path straight and all that stuff. It's a, it's a symbolic saying here. It's metaphorical. Make straight paths for your feet. What's one of the ways, metaphorically or spiritually, you can make your paths for your feet straight? What's some of the ways that you can do that? Yes. Walking in the Spirit. Good. Anyone else? Yes. Not walking crooked. Well, t try telling that to a drunk. <laughs> Let's look at Psalm uh, 119.105. You can look it up. It'll be up on the screen if you don't want to look it up in your Bible, but I challenge you to look it up in your Bible. Get your fingers walking through the Bible pages. It says, thy word is a, a lamp where? And a light unto my path. Okay? Keep that in mind. I'm going to read that in Hebrews again. Make straight paths for your feet. How you make straight paths for your feet is by giving credence to the word of God. Because the word is a lamp unto your feet. 
You ever go into a dark place and, you don't, and the lights are not on and you stumble and trip over things because you can't see them? It's the same way spiritually. A lot of times we're walking around and we don't see things as clearly and we, we, we don't see things clearly in the spirit. So we're walking around and kind of stumbling a little bit. Well, how to overcome that is by uh, allowing the word of God, which is a lamp unto your feet, in other words, it's going to give you light unto your path. Amen? And you're going to be able to know how to walk. The Bible says that we should walk worthy, amen, of the Lord. And that we would walk in a way that was pleasing to the Lord. And so he says, make straight paths for your feet. One way we do that is by being obedient to what God says in his word. When we open up the word and we see God saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. God has already prepared a way for you. He's already prepared a way for me. And the path that God has for us sometimes is, is not what we think it is now. Sometimes God has a path for us and walking for us that we, we don't fully understand it. And, God, and sometimes, you know, God will say, go left instead of right. And, and sometimes that will save your life if you listen to the voice of God. Amen? So he says... Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. In other words, if you don't go in the paths and you don't set the right straight paths for your feet by hearing God's word, listening to God's word, going God's way, moving in his direction, walking in his ways, then you're going to experience some lame times. And you're going to be out of the way, not in the way. Jesus said, I am the way. The way, the truth, the life. And you need to know the way of God. That's what I love about Moses. When I study about Moses, and I read about Moses, it says, Moses knew God's ways, the people, his acts. So people are always running for the acts of God, the miracles of God, the separation of the sea, you know, the healing of the blind, you know, the dead being raised, they're looking for all of those miracles and acts of God, but they don't know God's ways. If you look at the church, you study the church at large, you'll find out what I'm saying, is that many of the churches today, many of them, not all of them, thank God, I believe there's still 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal. I believe that there's still some churches out there that are really seeking God, really praying, really wanting the things of God, but... Many of the church today is, is going the way. I, I just heard another one to, tonight about, it's called the local church. And they're, um, they're just way off. In fact, they're listed as a cult. And how uh, they're just trapping people into this, these religions and these false cults and everything. And, uh, and uh, you know, we have to be careful. Even as a pastor, I have to be careful of, of uh, the, <clears throat> what's going on in the body of Christ and make sure that everyone is walking in the straight path, amen? Doctrinally, so that we have doctrinally pure teaching from the Word of God. Uh, and that uh, if we do err in anything, that God will quickly bring us back and bring the correction that is needed for our assembly. Because I believe that doctrine is the most important uh, aspect of foundational teaching in a person's life. And if you don't have that, then your, your building is going to be all uh, misplaced. But let it rather be healed. And how we're healed is, the Bible says he sent his word and what? Healed them. He sent his word. So when we come into obedience with the word, then the healings come. Right? Then the Bible says that the miracles, signs, and wonders follow the word. So as we are not only, not only does he send his word, but he expects something from us. And he expects us to keep that covenant with him. And to... Uh, be able to walk that covenant out in obedience. And as we do that, God will heal us. Amen? Amen? Praise God. And then he says in verse 14, to follow peace. That's a biggie. To follow peace. What's some of the ways that we can follow peace? This is a Bible study, so we can have a little interaction. What is the way, 
one of the, what are some of the ways that we can follow peace? Yes, Darren. Having communion with God, yes. But what does the script what does the scripture say? With all men. So I'll rephrase my question. How can we follow peace with all men? By what? By what be be willing to obey the Prince of Peace, yes. Someone else. This is not a test, so you can give your answers and uh, how how do we do that? How do we follow peace with all men? Showing kindness. Okay, yes, honey. Avoid gossip. Very good. You know, this is one of my favorite scriptures, and sometimes people say, you know, this person uh, ha has been saying this about you and saying that about you, and we've gone through our turmoils here at Horace Glory Christian Assembly. And people say, well, Pastor, you're not saying anything. We're only getting one side of the story. And the reason why I do that is because there's an old proverb in, in the Bible that I, I'm very familiar with and that I love very much. And it says this, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. That's one of the ways you can follow peace with all men. Now, that doesn't mean when a log needs to be thrown on, you don't throw it on. Okay? Uh, sometimes you need to have a little fire going. You know what I'm saying? But other times, there's other times when, you know, when you don't need to add flames to the fire. Um, and uh, I experienced that last week at your house. Uh, someone asked a question or asked me to do something, and the person was not ready for it emotionally or spiritually, and they wouldn't have been open for it, and I stopped. And that person recognized that. And, and see, that's how you make peace, because you can go on and on and on, and you can end up in a, in a brawl almost over arguing or you know, stuff like that. So how do you follow peace with all men? This is another way you can follow peace with all men. Um, let me see if I can find that. Look at Psalm 119, verse 165. Psalm 119, verse 65. And while you're doing that, I'm going to take a little sip of water. Is that the one I want? Maybe I got the wrong wrong reference. 119.105, I'm sorry. 119.105. Psalm 119.105. It should be. There's 176 verses in Psalm 119. No, one, oh, I'm sorry. Is that the one? Wait a minute. Wait, hold on. Hold on. That's 119, 165. That's 105. Okay. Okay, that's the one. Thank you. Look at this. What does it say? Great peace. Hold it right there. Not just peace, but great peace have they which what? Love thy law. What's the law? The word of God. Do you love God's word? Then you'll have great peace when you're walking in obedience to it. And nothing shall what? Offend them. When a man's ways please the Lord, the Bible says, he makes even his enemies at peace with him. So in order for that to happen, you have to learn how to be a good negotiator. You have to know when, you know, uh, the world says you've got to know how to pick your battles. You've got to know how to pick your fights. You know, husband and wife, you know, you've got to know when to fight and when not to fight. and You know, when to say, when not to say. You need to understand that a lot of times we're fighting battles that we shouldn't be fighting. Amen. Great peace have they which love thy law. Nothing offends them. And when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes his enemies at peace with him. You know why? Because when a man's ways please the Lord, there is divine favor on that person. 
I mean, it's awesome. You have divine favor. God opens doors. He does things. And you go, wow. And, and the enemies look at you and go, wow. How can, how can that happen? See? And sometimes, you know, especially in, in this world where you work in the, in the secular places, they don't treat everybody evenly and fairly. They have their little favorites. Amen? But when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies at peace with him. Why? Because he's not jealous, not envious. He's not doing any of those things. You know, he's just him and Jesus. And you know what? Lord, I'm here. This is the, this is the door you've opened for me, and I'm going to be glad, and I'm going to just be happy, and I'm not going to look at all the, all the other stuff that's going on over there, although because that could cause a fire. You know, hear what I'm saying? And an eruption. And if someone asks you, then that's a different story. I've had people at one time years ago just look at me and say, there's something different about you. Something's different about you. What is it? And you can tell them about Jesus. There's favor on your life. There should be favor on your life as a Christian. Just think about it. God's favor on you for your obedience in the Lord. There should be divine favor. And then he says this. Go back to Hebrews for me. He says this. Follow peace with all men and what? And holiness. In other words, don't be tainted by the things that are going on in the world. Don't let the, the society of the world and the thinking of the world and the way of the world influence you. Follow holiness. Amen? And a good way to do that is in how you present yourself, how you speak, how you act where you go, what you do. Amen. Because that will have a big impact. You follow peace with all men and holiness. Let other people see that you're different. You know, I, I, I stress this really strongly in our church because you don't need to look like the world to win the world. Because if the world doesn't see any difference, then why should they? But if they see someone, you know, like, like somebody uh, once told me that, that someone had said something to them about, it was, a, it, was a, it was a woman, a girl, and she said, you know, friends of hers said, if you haven't lost your virginity by, by now, then, you know, you're a loser. But that's the way of the world. But just think how special that's going to be on your wedding night. That this man is going to know that you have such morals and convictions and holiness and walking with God. And such an inner strength and an inner beauty that, wow, this is awesome. Amen. That's, that's, that, but the world looks at it different. The world looks at it twisted. Just the opposite. Woe unto those who call evil good and good evil. And then he goes and he says this, and he makes the qualifier of those who do follow peace with all men in holiness. And he says this, without which, in other words, if you're not doing this, if you're not pursuing following peace, you're not pursuing following holiness, without that, no man shall see the Lord. Hello? You won't see the Lord. And then verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. How can you fail the grace of God? How do you fail the grace of God?
Anybody have an idea? By ignoring what Jesus did on the cross? Yeah, that's, that'll fit in there. I can take that, yeah? Yes. Walking away from salvation? Yeah. Failing the grace of God, Bobby? By denying Christ? Yeah. The more pinpoint answer to that, and they're all right what you said, but the more pinpoint answer to that is this. In Titus it says that the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness, worldly lusts, and to live righteously, soberly in this present age. How we fail the grace of God is by not listening are allowing the grace of God to teach us. To shun ungodliness and worldly lusts. And to live righteously, soberly in this present life. That's how we fail God's grace. By not allowing that transformation in our lives. And he said, let, and then he goes on, he says this, lest any root of bitterness, no, nope, go back, go back, lest, thank you, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. What's bitterness? What is bitterness? Hmm? Unforgiveness? Bitterness is an attitude. It's, it's, a, it's a grudge. But what's the root of bitterness? Bitterness is only the dandelion that pops up out of the ground. There's something deeper than bitterness. Yes. Offense? Yes. Unforgiveness, hatred, all of these are uh, manifestations, but it's not the root. You're going to be so amazed when you hear this. Yes. Disobedience, jealousy. But in this context, always remember, we have to get the meaning from the context. Verse 7 says, If we endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For they that verily for a few days were chastened after that their own pleasure, that, but, not for, uh, but for their own profit, that they might be partakers of his holiness. We see that there's correction here. There's something going on here in this chapter. And then he says, uh, here he says, um, Lest any man uh, fall of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you. What's the root? I'm looking for the root. What's the root? One's emotions. Partially. Sin. Okay. Turn with me, please. To, uh, turn with me to De Deuteronomy 29 for a moment. And I believe this is particularly the area that it's talking about in uh, Hebrews. Okay? It's uh, Deuteronomy 29, starting with verse 18. Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart, what? Turneth away this day from the Lord. It's very similar to what was going on in, in uh, Hebrews we were talking about, right? about failing the grace of God. Lest there should be among you a man or a woman or a family or a tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord, our God, to go and serve other gods or to serve the gods of the, these nations. In other words, <clears throat> if we can put it in the church vernacular, 
those who are trying to live like the world in the church. Okay. And go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood, a poison. Now look at the next verse, uh, verse 19. And it come to pass when he hears the words of this curse. Are you hearing me? And it'll come, when it comes to pass, when he hears the words of this correction, or this instruction... That he blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of my heart to add drunkenness to thirst. In other words, what that's saying in, in Hebrews here, the root is this. They are hearing what God is saying. They're hearing what God says. And the curse that will come upon a person. And what they're saying is, is that I don't need to follow that. I can still live the way I want to live. Do what I want to do. I can still walk in the imagination of my heart to add drunkenness to, my, to, the, to thirst. I, the curse is not going to happen to me. I'm going to be blessed. Does that sound familiar? That's what's going on in a lot of churches. That's what goes on with eternal security. They say the same thing. No matter how I live, because I'm, I'm, I'm under grace, I'm saved, doesn't matter or anything, I'm going to be blessed. I'll be blessed. I don't have to obey God's word in whatever direction, you know. I don't have to obey God and what he says in his word, because I'm, I'm going to be blessed. And though I walk in the imagination of my heart, and I'll add drunkenness to thirst, it's not going to affect me. <sighs> hmm. That's the root. Indifference. And out of that comes bitterness and all that other stuff that comes along. But in the particular context of Scripture right here in Hebrews. I lost my place. Eh. Look in diligent, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Now see, understand this. When you have a private walk with God, it should only affect you. Right? But it says, and thereby many be defiled. So what it's saying is, is that what I read in Deuteronomy is a person that says within himself and is living contrary to what he knows should be done, and that there's a penalty or a consequence that's going to take place if they continue in disobedience. They say within themselves, that's not going to happen to me. I'll tell you a quick story. I think I might have told it to you years ago. We had a friend, and, and uh, <clears throat> we were at a Friday night prayer meeting with Brother George Cooty at uh, Brother Tony's house. And my wife and uh, I don't think we were married at the time. I don't think we were married at the time. And uh, it was a Friday night meeting, and I was there, and I had just started coming to the church. And um, God gave me a word. And I said, um, there's uh, maybe one or two people, I don't know, I don't know who you are, but God is telling me to tell you, you need to stop smoking. If you don't, you're going to get cancer, you're going to die. One of them was Linda's mother. And uh, after a, what, a month or so, she didn't smoke anymore. She, until the day she died, she never smoked again. The other person, okay, didn't take heed to the word. Well, months would go by, and God is merciful. How many know God's merciful? He's loving, okay? 
Months went by, a year went by. God put it on my heart. And uh, I went up to this sister and I told her, I said, Sister, do you remember the word of the Lord? What word? Do you remember that? About a year ago, Friday night service, the Lord spoke. That anyone that was, uh, if you were involved in smoking, to quit because you would die of cancer. Yeah, yeah. This is exactly what happened. When I told her what would happen, she said within herself, that's not going to happen to me. I'm not going to receive that. Hello? That's not going to happen to me because I love the Lord. God knows my heart. You hear those things all the time. God knows my heart. I love the Lord. Well, your actions should be speaking more so than your words. Time went on a little bit more. Maybe a few years, five, ten years, whatever it was, I don't remember. We get a phone call. Sister Rose is in the hospital. She's not doing good. They're going to do a CAT scan on her brain, a CAT scan, and, you know, do the whole MRI, the whole nine yards. Something happened, she was out of short of breath or something, I don't remember. A couple of nights had passed. We were waiting, I believe, for the weekend to go see her in the hospital. One night I was sleeping, and right out of a dead sleep, I sat up in bed. I don't know how that happens. How does that happen? You're in bed, and all of a sudden, boink. You're like this. You know what I mean? I don't know, hands, no nothing. You just, up you go. And Linda woke up. She goes, what's the matter? I said, I just seen Rose in a casket. She's going to die. We need to get there. So we went there, and the Lord said, I want you to anoint her. I want you to anoint her with oil, not for healing, to prepare her for burial. And I went to her. I prayed with her. I kissed her. And she kind of whispered some things to me. I believe she said, I wish I would have listened. And she died. See, our actions, what we do, sometimes we think it only affects us, but it doesn't just affect us. It affects everyone. Everyone. That's why when one, the Bible says, when one part of the body aches, we all ache. You know, when I'm thinking of aching, I'm, I'm looking and I'm saying, pray for Angel. I see her chair's empty. She's, she's hurting in her body. Pray for her. And then on the other side of the coin, when one is honored, we're all honored. And that's a great blessing. When, when one person's honored, we're all honored. When one person aches, we should all ache for that person. He said, looking diligently. That's not just like, no. Look diligently. Examine. Closely. Sometimes people don't like talking to me because I ask a lot of questions. And I ask questions for a reason. The reason I want to ask questions is because I want to make sure I get every avenue that I possibly can to see if I can be used by God to fix something. I'm not trying to be nosy in people's business. I'm trying to see if there's an angle or a door or something, how the enemy came in and how he's trying to cause division or whatever. That's my job. And so I ask a lot of questions, looking diligently into something. When you search the scriptures, like the Bible says, study to show yourself approved. Don't just read it real quick. Study means to tear apart, take apart, look at the words, what the meanings were. Look at the historical value. Look at the cultural value. What, was the, what were they thinking at the time, whoever the writer was? What was on his mind as he was writing that? What was going on around him during that time? As Paul said, endure hardship as a good soldier in Timothy. He was telling Timothy. 
Well, how could Paul write that? What was his condition? Ask these questions. What was his condition? What was Paul's condition when he was admonishing Timothy and he said, endure hardship as a good soldier? Well, when you do the, huh? Yes, but even more so. He was in prison, but if you read, you'll find that when he was imprisoned, there was a God that was chained to him. Twelve hours a day. And that Roman God had to stand. Chain. And Paul was writing and the inspiration of God came upon him and he said, write this to Timothy. Endure hardship as a good soldier. So you see the implication of that. Looking diligently. Looking deeply. Looking something more than just, you know, some of these expositors and some of these people that interpret the Bible in this allegorical method, it, it really bothers me. They make it to mean something it didn't, wasn't originally intended for the original writing to be meant. And that's why we got so many different views and so many different teachings going all over the place. But looking diligently into what? Looking diligently at our own lives to see if we are failing the grace of God. How are we failing God's grace? How are we not allowing that grace to teach us and instruct us to deny ungodliness, worldly lust, and live presently, soberly, righteously in this present life? I like Strong's definition of grace. It's the divine influence upon your heart with the reflection of that influence in your life. That's the true meaning of grace. It's not just unmerited favor, all of the theological aspects of it. There's, there's an intimacy about it. It's the influence, God's influence of His grace in your heart. And with that comes obedience. And when we're obedient to that grace, then it reflects in our life. And people see us. When my, my father, when my, uh, my mom passed away, I had to do the funeral. Now think about that. And I didn't put an act on for anybody. But I asked God, I said, God, I need your grace. This is hard. I want you to think about that. You having to perform your own mother's funeral. I said, Lord, this is hard. I need your grace. And I had ministers that came, people that came and said, God's grace is on you. His strength is on you. Did I weep? Yes, I cried. I, I, I cried for my mom. It's like you cried for your mom. But there was a strength. There was that grace that God gave. You know, when Paul prayed, he said, Lord, I have this thorn in my flesh because of this revelation that I have. And he prayed three times to God, God, please take this thorn away. Take this thing away. What did God say? He said, my grace. <laughs> Phew. I, I'm, I hope you're getting this. He said, my grace is sufficient. In other words, my grace will pull you through anything. Anything. Anything you face in life, my grace is able to help you and to maneuver you to the place where you need to be. Diligently, lest you fail of the grace of God. I don't want to fail the grace of God. If I'm failing grace, then I'm walking in law. 
And if I'm walking in law, then I'm, working, I'm walking in legalism. And there's a curse on the law. Because I can't keep the law. Doesn't mean that we don't obey the law. But in and of ourselves, there's no one here that can keep the law, for so there's none righteous. No, not one. So we need to yield over, or we need to lean upon the assistance of this grace. I think it's, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the book. It's by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I don't remember the name of the book, but I'll tell you, it's a powerful book. He talks about how men have cheapened God's grace to a place of lasciviousness, a place of license, a place of where it, Grace has only become a band-aid to cover our sin. Grace doesn't cover sin. The animal sacrifices in the Old Testament covered sin. But it didn't have the power to take away sin. Only the blood of Jesus... Grace and truth came through Jesus. And only the blood of Jesus can take away sin. Whew. Hallelujah. That grace, grace, wonderful grace. God should love a sinner such as I. How wonderful is love like that. That God gave us grace and truth through, through, through Jesus. Through Him. We fail Him when we fail grace. I promise you we're going to get through Hebrews by... May or June. <laughs> yeah. Less, verse 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. Did you know that about Esau? That he was a fornicator? And a profane person. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Remember the story with Jacob and Esau? They fought. Even in the womb. Even as Esau, for one morsel of meat... He sold his birthright. I like to say it this way. For one, provision for the flesh. One provision for the flesh. Sold his birthright. There have been people that have followed Christ, was excited about Jesus, had direction for their life, where they were going, and then all of a sudden, an opportunity came in, someone came in and made redirection to that life. All it takes is one slip, one bad judgment, one mistake can ruin your life. Remember reading a story 
but a man. And he was trying to live a Christian life. One day he decided he was going to go out with a few friends. They were unsaved friends, but he had some he had these friends. One of the biggest lies of the enemy is hang around with your unsaved friends because you'll get them saved. That's a lie. That doesn't happen. Not if you're hanging around them. You may spend some time with them. It's different. And so we had the, these friends over that were not saved. and uh, They went out to eat, you know, to a very innocent. They went out to eat somewhere, but some of them started ordering drinks. Oh, come on, you can have a drink. You used to drink with us before you became one of them holier-than-thou Christians, you know, how they use the things of God to make you feel guilty or like you they make you feel like you think you're better than somebody else and so he said well maybe if I have just one you know they'll see I'm a normal person like them well one turned to two turned to three to four to five until he was pretty intoxicated then being in that state of mind not being sober minded they all decided to go to a nightclub and they went into this nightclub, and people were dancing and everything, and he met this girl. They started dancing. And you kind of know what happens when you dance, especially slow dancing. I don't need to paint a picture. You know what goes on if you've been in a nightclub on the dance floor in the dark. Well, they ended up together in a hotel somewhere and spent the night together. Next day he got up and he was so ashamed of what he had done and didn't know how he got there and what had happened and his friends all laughed at him and said, oh, you don't remember going off with so-and-so and spending the night? And he said, no. And as the months went on and a year and a half went by, all of a sudden he started not feeling himself. so he would talk to his pastor and his friends and they said you don't look yourself you need to go to the doctors and have an examination and he did and come to find out that the woman was infected with HIV and he had HIV and now the death sentence began to come what seemed like one innocent are you hearing me? one innocent decision I'm just going with my friends turned into a tragedy a loss of his destiny and his purpose because he didn't listen to grace He gave up his birthright for a measly bowl of pottage. Think about that. All his inheritance, everything that God had for him, prominence, success, material blessing, honor in the family as the head of his family. favor of God and man sold it all just to satisfy his hunger what will you sell to satisfy your hunger what are you willing to do to satisfy your hunger are you willing to fail the grace of God in your life for a measly morsel of meat? Do 
you sell your birthright for one compromise. Well, I can tell you, this is a good old boy saying no. <laughs> and I'll tell you, there's not one, one person here that's more than me that loves to eat chicken and, and steak and, and, you know, I can't wait for that Brazilian grill to open up. Because I'm going to go. I want to have a taste of that meat and maybe some of you all come with us and we'll have a big party and we'll just have a good time in the Christian way. He sold his bread. For you know, that's what I love about God's word. God allows, listen, listen to me. I wonder how Esau would feel knowing that there would be millions upon millions of people reading about his failure. How would you feel? That if there was a book written with your failures in it, that you knew all of the world would have access to your failure. That's why he says, for you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing in the future. See, we sell out for the now. We sell out for the now. We go into debt, we do all kinds of things to be satisfied for the now. And I believe that God wants us to be out of debt as Christians. Why? One reason, when we go on mission trips, you have extra money to go. You can do things for God. Amen. But you know that he would have inherited the blessing when he would have. So this tells me that there's a loss here. That, that once saved, always saved, you're not going to get everything. You know, afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was what? Rejected. Disqualified. No longer able to receive. You know, there comes a time in a person's life they can reach a place of apostasy. Where the grace of God no longer touches them. And it comes through continuous, repeated disobedience. Time after time after time. And I believe the mercy of God and the love of God is, is there to bring us to that place of repentance. To that place where we will turn our hearts to Him. And He's knocking at the door of your heart. And the more we say no... The less of the knock. Until one day when there's no longer a knock. He said he would have had received this inherited blessing, but he was rejected. Why? For he found no place of repentance. Remember that saying, opportunity only knocks once? That's the world. But I believe God gives us opportunity after opportunity. But some of the major decisions of your vocation or your calling that God has for you, if you keep ignoring, pushing aside, eventually... You'll want that blessing. Think of how it will be standing before Jesus. He says, I wanted to win thousands of people through you. But you were more interested in television. You were more interested in doing your thing. You weren't interested in prayer meetings. But whenever there's food at the church, you're right there at the table. 
You're more interested in all the things of the world and all the allurements of the world, but I wanted to use you to bring thousands to me. And you say, me? Just little me? Yes. You! Why not you? Why not you? Why can't God use you to bring thousands? Because it's not you anyway. It's your obedience of allowing the Holy Spirit to flow through you. To reach the lost. To go on the mission field. But we think, I'm, un I'm un incapable, I can't do this, I can't do that. I don't have this, I don't have that. God says, I can give it to you. I'll give it to you. David Livingston, missionary, you remember, Dr. Livingston, I presume, remember that? Missionary to Africa. Left his wife home because she was sick and she couldn't be in the jungle anymore. Said, I'll be back. I believe he hadn't seen her in two years. Then he came back and he says, I'm going back. How are you doing? How are things? Stayed with her for a little while. I don't know how long he was he stayed with her. Then he left and he was gone five years. And he would go through Africa from the very point down in south of Africa. He would go up the middle of Africa to the Amazons and to the, high, the most difficult jungles. And he would share the gospel and hundreds would come to Jesus. And in that track he ended up with malaria and sickness. And he was there with fever and the shivering and the sweating. And you think someone would want to give up. But he wasn't about to sell his birthright. And so they would take the medicine. This is a true story. They would literally take him on a cart, walking miles and miles to the next village. They would put the cart down. He'd get up. He'd preach. People would get saved. They would leave teachers behind to disciple and then he'd go to the next village well he made it all the way to the middle of Africa and he was so sick that they he said one night to them he said please just let me pray just leave me and on the side of his bed in the hut that he was staying in he got on his knees and he just prayed he must have been there most of the night but in the morning when they went to get him they shook him and he fell over. He was dead. And then the wife found out the news and she wanted to have his body shipped back. And the African people, this just touches my heart. The African people said, he loved us so much. He had such a heart for us. Please, please let us take his heart out and bury it in the ground of Africa so we will remember him. That is favor. That is someone that would not sell his birthright. And his heart still today is buried in the center of Africa. And you wonder why that Africa has experienced one of the most explosive revivals. Powerful, moving, real. But he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance. Even though he sought it carefully with tears. You can cry your heart out. But if you've sold your blessing, your salvation, 
for a mere morsel of sin and just some worldly pleasure for one little season. Which in churches today, they're allowing that to happen. People sleeping together, unmarried, drug addicts coming in, putting them in leadership, homosexuals, lesbians, leading worship, saying, it's okay. I'm going to be blessed. The curse will not come upon me. That's the root. That's the root. My time is up. I want to read you just... It was a pastor, John, he wrote this <clears throat> in closing. He said, therefore, a root of bitterness is a person or a doctrine in the church which encourages people to act presumptuously and treats salvation as an automatic thing that does not require a life of vigilance in the fight of faith in the pursuit of holiness. Such a person or doctrine defiles many and can lead to the experience of Esau, who, who played fast and loose with his inheritance and could not repent in the end and find life. Jesus is coming soon. No, no, no. You hear me? I know you heard it all your life. Probably heard it since you were a little person. Whether you're Catholic, Protestant, it doesn't matter. But I'm telling you, as I'm standing here, Jesus is coming real soon. The prophecies that are being fulfilled are amazing. That quick. What are you, we going to do? Are we going to get ready or be ready? I don't want to get ready. I want to be ready. Amen. Are there any questions? Comments of tonight's Bible study. Did you get fed something tonight? Amen. Did I get you thinking about things? Take what I said and allow the grace of God to examine your hearts to see, Lord, what area does it need to be impregnated into me so that I will not make the wrong decisions and listen to the voice of those who are trying either directly or indirectly to, root, to steal my blessing and my inheritance. Father, thank you. Lord, I went a little over tonight, but I thank you and I praise you. God, I ask that you would bless your people, Father. That you would bless them tonight, Father God. Keep them. Keep them by the power of your grace and your mercy. I offer you, Lord, my life, the rest of the days of my life, to serve you, to walk in your ways, so that, Lord, as the Apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Lord, I want to be a blessing to your people. Help me, Lord. Help me to be a, a, a more in-depth learner, more in-depth speaker, and a more in-depth liver, someone who will live even deeper. Lord, your Apostle Paul said, that I may know Christ. I don't want to know anything else except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Help us, Lord, to live like that. Let your grace work in us, Father. Let your mercy be with us. Teach us, O oh, grace of God. Teach us and lead us into the paths of righteousness for your namesake. Lord, <clears throat> the love of many are waxing cold because 
Sin is abounding. Sin is abounding in the churches. Help us, Lord, not to look to the left or to the right, but help us to look to you for guidance and leadership in the things and the ways that we must live as we see the day drawing nigh, Lord. Many are falling away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Many are falling into cults. Many are falling into false religions. Many are falling, Lord, into false doctrine. Keep us on the right path, Lord. Lord, keep us humble, Lord. Let us stay humble before you. For you said, if you, if you will humble yourself, you will exalt us in due time. Humble us, Lord. Keep us humble, Lord. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.